Hey Calgary, this is Sean Boonstra, host of TV's Authentic. If you've been paying attention, you know this world is starting to feel like it's coming unhinged with wars, pandemics, natural disasters, and unrest. And it turns out that Bible prophecy actually talks about this stuff and shows us where we're headed. Join me for a free event called Revelation Speaks Peace starting April 14 at the Windsport Event Center. Claim your free seat right now at revelationspeakspeace.com. Welcome to the Lessons for Living television program. My name is Bill Santos. Thank you so much for watching. Well, we have Pastor Sean and Pastor Alex back with us again this week. Guys, this is becoming uh, a regular occurrence. I love we're, it. We're just surprised. We're, we're yeah. surprised you invited us back. And <laughs> We've yeah. enjoyed living in your basement. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, you know, and the food and drink's pretty good over at the Santos house, and there's a ping pong table down there. We're happy. Well, that's great. Well, I enjoy having you guys here. You know what? It, uh, I don't have to carry the load of the program, right? Yeah. I got you guys, and you have such interesting insights to provide. And so, well, that's kind but of you know, I, I, we're, we're going to talk about something I, that I find fascinating. And Sean, you'd made reference to the sort of Christian history as sort of a yeah an area of real interest for you and in study. We're going to talk about that, but so that we, we don't forget, you know, why we're having you on the program. We really want to let folks know that starting April the 14th, April 14th, you guys are going to be in Calgary, Calgary, Canada. Yeah, yep. give us a Alex, give us a quick. Windsport at that. the uh, at the Olympic Center in Calgary, Canada. We are we're going to be putting on a, a Bible seminar, a prophecy seminar, where we'll be looking at uh, the Scripture from from beginning to, to end. Obviously, can't read read the whole thing, but we're going to be looking at some of the major uh, the major stories, the the major prophecies, the things that have happened in the in the past, because the Bible has predicted so many. It is the only only book out there in the world that has has predicted things so many times, and every single time has got it historically right. And, and so we're we're going to be showing that and how how that applies to our lives today. And, uh, and what the Bible says will happen in the future. We, we don't have to guess about what's, what's happening. And you know, in the world today, there's so much uncertainty. Yes. There's, uh, it's like the world has fallen apart and we're yes. asking questions about what's gonna what happen yes. next. And the Bible tells us exactly what's gonna happen next. And, and that's what we're gonna be sharing together for, uh, for a few days out there in, in, in Calgary. So uh, April 14th yep. is, is the start, 7 p.m. Uh, at the Windsport uh, Arena, the the hockey arena, the main hockey arena there, and I think we're going to have an exciting time. So, want to oh, invite everybody to come out. Yeah, I, I can't you know, encourage folks enough to get out there. They can uh, register. RevelationSpeaksPeace.com. You can. We'll hold your seats for you. You know, just tell us how many seats you want within reason. I think there is a cap, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, but you can invite six. Or you can hold six seats. Look, there's lots of free seats, but the good ones, you know, the keener row, keener row up in the front, <laughs> that's reserved. And uh, and so, yep, absolutely free. This is a service. The, the world's been good to us for nearly 100 years as a ministry, and uh, we like giving back. And so we pick one city a year somewhere in the world. And, uh, and Calgary right, was fortunate. Calgary's it. Calgary's well, it. Calgary, yep. I got a wife from Alberta that can't, you know, you have to give something back to Calgary. <laughs> That's right. And, and, here's, and here's the secret. If you, uh, if you, if you run out of, of, of the cap on the seats, just re-register under a different name. You'll have six more. So you, you <laughs> Pastor can, you can Alex register. Is Nobody the else will know Canadian that. Public how to be dis <laughs> he's does. He's not a Canadian, and that's why he's as dishonest as he is. <laughs> oh, oh, I can't put up with this kind of abuse. <laughs> <laughs> I love true. coming into the country with Alex. I got to tell you what. Okay, folks. Here's the truth. I've got both. I've got both. I'm born Canadian, but when I come here flash my Canadian passport. Come on in. Welcome home. He gets strip searched and questioned. Yeah, as he, yeah. As he looks at me and smiles. I always tell the guards, you know, I think that guy back there swallowed something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised they what still a great travel party. The... Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. It's just yeah. fantastic. That's wonderful. I, I can see why you would want to travel with him all the time. <laughs> hey, you know what? Uh, yeah. We had talked in, in our preparation and, um, you know, we, you know, what we're going to talk about here. And one of the 
one of the topics, so one of the interesting ones we already addressed in a previous program, why men hate going to church. But yeah. another one that, uh, you know, historically I thought really resonated was this idea that these freedoms that are, I don't know if you want to say enshrined or, you know, in, in, in the American right. Constitution Bill of Rights, their origin, you know, is, 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 is interesting where that came from. Contrary to popular belief, right? Right. Right. You know, it didn't come from the Enlightenment. It came from another source. Yeah, it, it did. And, um, and you know, this can be very American-centric. Sorry, I am Canadian, but let's admit it. You know, I grew up watching 85% of the shows outside of the beachcombers. I was watching American TV, and so are you. Okay. So we, we kind of know who our cousins to the South are. And they started something in the late 18th century that resonated around the Western world. We kind of think now that the way we live has always been that way. You know, we're free. We can go to whatever church you want. You cannot go to church if you want. You can, you can believe in whatever God you want. You can, you know, we think that it's always been that way because it's been that way for a few generations. But the liberty that we enjoy in the Western world today is an exceptionally rare thing, historically mm -hmm. speaking. There are brief windows of it here and there. The Persians allowed it. And that's probably the last time it was as close as it is now. The Persians, you know, after defeating the Babylonians, the Persians basically let their subjects believe what they wanted and worship how they wanted, and they were real empire builders. The, uh, the Romans did it to an extent until they found out Christians couldn't add you know, Caesar to their gods. They would only have one god, so they persecuted the Christians. But what we have today is so exceedingly rare, and most of us in the West can really thank. I know we complain a lot about our American neighbors and so on. You know, what, what's the old saying from the 70s? You know, it's like sleeping next to an elephant. If it rolls over, it crushes you. Right. You know, so I get it. I get what that's like. But we really do, there's something we can thank them for. Most of the liberty we enjoy in the Western world was hard won in the 1700s. And it actually stretches back a lot lot further than that. I've spent a lifetime looking at this. And here's where we think, you know, a lot of people have this sneaking hunch that religion somehow in the West went wrong. They've got this gut feeling something's wrong with organized religion. And they're not entirely wrong. There's lots that's organ wrong with organized religion. Now, let me pause for a moment. When people bring that up, I say, well, what's the alternative? You want disorganized religion? You know, right. that's not. The Bible does talk about organized religion, but we still have this nagging sense something went wrong, and most people have trouble pinpointing exactly what it is. It's not that hard to figure out. The Romans are persecuting Christians as soon as they figure out that Christians aren't Jews. Right? The Romans are looking at, ah, one more Jewish sect. Right. And the Jews had religious protection that was granted to them by uh, Julius Caesar. They, they were given protection because they had aided the Jews at one, uh, the Romans at one point, and so they're given exemption. All they had to do is pray for the health of the empire, and they would never have to worship the Caesar. As soon as they figure out that Jews and Christians aren't the same thing anymore, that there's a divergence, mm. Christians no longer have that protection. That protection. Got it. The Jews were called a religio, where we get the word religion. That's an official state religion. Uh, Christians were called a uh, superstitio, where we get superstition from. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, they don't have a God, they're atheists, and they won't worship Caesar. And it was all kinds of rumors were spread, so they persecute them. That persecution gets to a peak in the early fourth century with Diocletian. Diocletian goes after Christians particularly hard for 10 years. Uh, he really unleashes all the fury of the empire on Christians. And this is where most of the stories you heard growing up come from, Christians in the circus and, and so on. And then Constantine um, takes over the empire. At that point, there were up to eight different people pretending to be emperors scattered around the empire. Constantine rides into Rome very famously, conquers the city of Rome. And there's an old legend that says he had a vision of the cross in the sky, in hoc signo vinces. God is telling him, in this sign, conquer. There's a question mark as to how authentic that story is, but what we do know is that Constantine's mother was a practicing Christian, and so he was somewhat interested in this Christian God. And when he won, he figured, maybe this Christian God helped me unite the empire. And he watched Christians as they were being persecuted, saying, man, they're so united. Mm. Nothing makes them buckle. What if I had right. that kind of unity to hold the Roman the Empire, Empire together? together. Yeah. He probably should have gone, no yeah, yeah. yeah. gone to a few <laughs> That's church right. board meetings. Yeah. You know? <laughs> That's right. yeah. But... Um, and then what happened is this, after the persecution ends, he makes a gift. The Lateran Palace is given to the Bishop of Rome. He moves from this shed on the other side of the Tiber River into the palace. It's now the official religion of the Roman Empire. Persecution stops. 
Then some controversies break out in North Africa. You get the Donatist controversy. What's that? Bishops who pretended not to be Christian during the persecution want their jobs back now. And the church says, no, no, you, you, know, you yielded up your Bible, you pretended not to be Christian, and they can't solve it, so they appeal to Constantine. Hey, how about you help us solve it? You, you favor Christians. So they invite the king into the church. And, uh, and he's too busy, so he has some... Uh, then there's another, the Arian controversy, where we've got a priest in North Africa who's denying the divinity of Christ. And he's saying, no, Jesus is not fully God, and, he's, you know, and it's a big problem. That's why the council... They again appeal to the emperor, which is why we get the Council of Nicaea. Here's what we did. We essentially invited the Roman emperor into the affairs of the Christian church. And on the one hand, great, persecution ends, we're free, we can spread, we've got Roman roads to use, we've got, you know, there's a lot of upside to that as Christians know from studying their history. There's a big downside. As the Western Roman Empire collapses, as we get to the end of the fifth century, Roman troops are going home. Why are we gonna stay in Britain? It's over, everybody right. go home, the barbarians are winning. So they go home and they leave open all these posts, these vacancies all over the empire. The church steps into all of these political positions a Roman administrative unit in the field was called a diocese. Mm. There's, there's lots of remnants of this. What do we still call in a lot of Christian traditions a, a, an administrative yeah. unit? Diocese. diocese. We stepped into that position and we get a blending of church and state. And sadly, we as Christians started to run the church the same way the Romans ran the empire. What do you do with a heretic? Well, you get rid of them. Yeah, you get rid of the heretic. Let's burn them at the stake. Let's yes. confiscate their property. Diocletian was doing that. You know, that's what he was doing. And as we know, you know, we may as well not pretend as Christians we didn't do this. We did this. It's dark. What we did was wrong. It didn't reflect the love of Christ whatsoever. And then we get to sort of, you know, we get to the 1500s and there's a change in attitude and people start saying, maybe we ought to check out the scriptures. Maybe we shouldn't be burning people at the stake. Maybe we shouldn't. I'm condensing an awful lot of history. Yeah. Then that brings us to England. And in England, we have this situation where Henry VIII is noticing, and all these German princes are throwing off the authority of the bishops. I got this problem. I can't get an annulment for my right. wedding, so maybe I'll, I'll just start my own church. I can do this too. So a lot of people joined that movement, the Church of England, for all the right reasons. Not Henry, but you know, a lot of it did for all the right reasons. It started to go off the rail, human nature being what it is. When we get to the 1600s, they start prescribing, no, 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 you can't be anything but the Church of England. And so you have to worship by the common book of prayer and you have to, and they have the conventicle act and they have all these laws saying, you can believe what you want in your head, but you will worship like mm. this in this okay. form. During this period in the 1600s, we get all kinds of people don't wanna do that, Quakers, Baptists, Barrowists, Fifth Monarchists. They studied the book of Daniel and saw the Fifth Monarchy as not a human king, it's Jesus returning and that kind of stuff. And a lot of them start fleeing. Some of them go to the Netherlands, like John Locke, who wrote you know, um, his treatise on, on, on liberty and the second treatise on government and some of the things that later became the foundation for the American government. Um, and he's hiding in the Netherlands because they accused him of treason for his religious beliefs. John Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress in prison for his religious beliefs, writes Pilgrim's Progress. And all these guys start to wonder, you know, what's going wrong with this? Why is it this way? Why are Christians persecuting each other? And why is the king the head of the church? And it bothers them because they've been taught since they were children, the divine right of kings. God put that king there. Right. Well, here's what happens. They get to the Netherlands and they meet a group of Jews that are hiding in the Netherlands. They're running away from the Inquisition. And so for the first time in centuries, Christians have access to the scriptures in Hebrew. Mm. And as they're reading the scriptures in Hebrew, uh, they're also reading old Jewish commentaries. And they get to the story in, well, let me look at it. It's 1 Samuel chapter 8, where Israel suddenly asks for a king. And God gets angry. And God says in 1 Samuel 8, Samuel, I'm going to give them a king. They're not going to like it. It's not going to be th good. That's right. Not going to like it. Well, it's going to be good. So uh, this might be worth just peeking yeah. at for a moment. Let me find, I did bring an iPad Bible, a preacher without a Bible. So first, I should have looked up the verse before the cameras rolled, Bill, because that would be good television instead <laughs> of what you're getting with Boonstra. So 1 Samuel, Israel demands a king. So here's what he says. Um, there shall be a king over us that we may be like the other, na other nations. They just want to be like everybody, everybody else. else, right? Mm -hmm. So God says, look, I'm going to let them have it. He says, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and be his horsemen or run before his chariots. You want a king? Fine, but you're going to get conscription. Yep. 
He will appoint for himself commanders of thousands, commanders of fifties, plow his ground, reap his harvest. You're going to be working for the government, not for yourself anymore. Make implements of war, the equipment of his chariots. He'll take your daughters to be perfumers. He'll take the best of your fields, a tenth of your grain. Take your male servants, your female servants. In that day, you will cry out because of your king. He says, you guys are asking for oppression. And the, God let them have it. So this is one thing they're studying with. Well, maybe kings were well, so, so, so a good idea. Yeah, maybe maybe yeah. God didn't want kings. Maybe God didn't <laughs> want kings. And they yeah. found that fascinating. This becomes the biggest religious debate of the 1600s. Interesting. Everybody. Milton is talking about it. Bunyan's talking about it. William Blake, the poet's talking about it. Thomas Hobbes, Leviathan. They're all talking about this. Maybe we weren't supposed to have a king. And that's when they discover Deuteronomy, um, where God warns them, one day you're going to have a king. And if you do, here are the guidelines. Listen to this. I will set a king over me. He says, when you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations around me. You may indeed set a king over you. God always lets us have what we want, whether, you know, he, but not without a warning. You may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. Now listen to this. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Hmm. Let me ask this question. As they were drafting the Constitution of the United States, what yeah, did the law say the president had to be? Must be born in the United States. Yeah, right? the where did they get that concept? Right here, Deuteronomy 17. That's where they got it. Only he might not acquire for himself horses or cause the people to return to Egypt. He may not acquire for himself many wives or excess silver and gold, a whole bunch of checks and balances to keep the power of the king in check. In check, mm -hmm. yeah. Right. When he sits on the throne of the kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book, a copy of this law approved by a Levitical priest. It shall be with him. He'll read it all the days of his life that he may f learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law. The king had to make a copy of the law for himself and live under that it. Law. Mm -hmm. So, in the 1600s, everybody's debating this. There's a whole bunch of persecuted Puritans who moved to Leiden, a city just outside of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. They're studying this stuff and they say, you know what, let's go to the New World. They become the pilgrims. They land at, you know, at Plymouth and they establish colonies. And these concepts are rolling around for almost 200 years. All right, if we're going to, and, and what they called Israel was, they called it the Hebrew Republic. If you go back and read what these people are saying, we need to have a republic. Maybe we can reverse this and not have a king. We did what Israel did. We invited the Roman emperor into the church and what a mess we've made ever since. Princes are telling the church what to do. The government's telling the church what to do. Right. What if we could pull that Separate back the apart? Two. So a wall of separation between church and state. This stuff was born out of the Protestant Reformation. They didn't get it right. If you study the colonies, the Puritans are like, okay, we're going to have a colony for Puritans. But they hung Mary Dyer, a Quaker, for preaching Quaker in the city square. They got it wrong for a while, but the principles were there. And the founding fathers, when you go back and read them, the American founding fathers, Jefferson, they weren't even all Christians. Jefferson wasn't what you would call a biblical Christian. Washington, Madison, they all said, this is where we're going to get this. As a matter of fact, the first seal they proposed for the United States was the children of Israel crossing the Red Sea and going mm. into the Promised Land to establish this style of republic. Everybody under the law, including the chief executive officer, these are the ideas that ended up in the American Bill of Rights and spilled out into the rest of the Western world, back to the Netherlands. Here in Canada, we've got the Bill of Rights. We assume now that we've got a right to the religion of our choice, and we've got a, relight, a right to say what we want, the freedom of speech and so on. That was all born out of the struggle to have religious liberty that spilled out of the Protestant Reformation, and then after that, out of all of the dissidents that came out of England saying, wait a minute, but we don't want to be Church of England. And so it was a long, hard road. We really struggled to get where we are. And we take it for granted today that mm. it's always been this way and it's, it's naturally this way. No, no. This, we're standing on the shoulders of centuries of Christians who learned the hard way right. when they did it wrong. And so my urge is this, look, keep it. It right. was hard to get here. Don't give it up easily. Don't give it up easily. It's possible for us. The reason we can all coexist, this is unique in human history. Right. Catholics and Orthodox and Protestants, and we're all living together right. and we're not killing each other. For the first time in centuries, we're not killing each other. That could come back in a heartbeat. So my plea is this, value this freedom. Mm -hmm. It's biblically based. Right. Let people answer to God by the dictates of their own conscience. Right. Don't dictate to each other. Enjoy this liberty. It's rare. Anyway, I could go on for yeah, hours. You know, it's interesting. I mean, is it just is it just me, or is there seem to be a bit of a push to bring government and religion back together again? 
Yeah, we tend to think that what's going to happen, you know, look, let's be honest, Christianity's in decline, right? Um, it is in decline. And we've done it to ourselves largely. So we kind of think if we only had another Constantine, you know, he just set the church free, right. you know, and he favored Christians. Be careful. The government that favors you today is against you in the next election. You don't want it. I think the, uh, they had the right idea south of the border. Keep it apart from each other. Just keep it apart from each other. There's always a pendulum that swings, and uh, it, it uh, either swings left or it swings it swings right. And and when you when you have it swung to one side, then there's there's this um, I guess it's a phenomenon or whatever you want to call it. It's it, it's going to overcorrect. It's, it's, you're going to overcorrect. <laughs> you're just going to yank back yeah. as as hard as you can yank back. And and instead of coming coming to balance, come coming to an equilibrium somewhere in in, in that center. Then, then you get uh, more of an, of an extreme push, and and I think that that's what we're seeing in society today. Uh, it's swinging in in one way, and and there's resistance, and it's just going to pull as hard as it can. And before you know it, we've we've swung the pendulum uh, again the to the other side. Yes. And and I think that that's that's probably for me the 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 message that that I get. Either either end is 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 an extreme at at some level, and, yes. and can we can we bring it back to? To, to center, you know, I, I think about I think about Calgary itself, uh, or Calvary. I keep saying Calgary because yeah, we're going to be going us, to Cal Calgary. But yeah. Cal I think about Calvary. You've got you got three crosses on Calvary. You've got um, you've got two thieves on each side, and and then you got Christ in the, in the center. Both of those sides are are, are are wrong. You know, the 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 thief on the left side, the thief on the on, on the far right side. These these are are extremes. And salvation was was right through this through yeah. this middle. And but society has a very difficult time coming to 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 a balance. It it seems to want to go to one extreme or the other. And I think that that's what we're experiencing now. And so some of these things that uh, that we have we have so fought. To to correct uh, over through the dark ages and coming into into the U.S. and of course, you know when we look at Daniel, Daniel, Daniel two and and seven and eight, Revelation twelve and thirteen, we see that something different was coming, something different than than had been born in Daniel two. You see the succession of these of these kingdoms and it's all rising from the very same place. And all of a sudden, you know, Revelation twelve and thirteen, it's it's totally different. It's coming yes. out of out of out of a totally different land. We know that God is predicting a change. And that change has happened, but uh, but we now seem to be wanting to slide to 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 something that that God was trying to pull us out of. And, out of yeah. and I think that that's the appeal. It's God, guys. God God has made this change for a reason. Let's not slide back. No spiritual revival has ever been launched by a law. Hmm. Well put. It doesn't work that way. Right. It doesn't work that way. You can't convert people by forcing them. You come to Christ of your own free will, mm -hmm. not yes. because it's the law to come. It failed. That's what we did for hundreds of years, yeah. and we shed torrents of blood. That's yeah. the way James Madison described the old world. Yeah. We shed torrents of blood persecuting each other. Yeah, and in fact, God will not accept anything that is not driven from love. You got it. Right? That's right. So you can't force people into Jesus. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. Oh, yeah, well, Jesus yeah. said, and I, if I be lifted up, will draw them unto myself. It's, it's the love of Christ that draws us, that compels us to, to come to him. And, and that's what we as Christians must, must demonstrate. And, and, and I think that uh, at, at many times uh, we haven't done a really good job of that. I think that's the issue. Yeah. I think we've dropped the ball a number of times and haven't portrayed to the world the true meaning of, of Christianity and, and, and Christ's love. And so the world looks at the church and sees, you know, yeah, M mayhem, and you know. Often, what I mean? when we see mayhem in the world, what do we think we need to do? Let's take over the reins of government. If this was just a Christian run by my ch a nation right. run by my church, right, it would have resolved it all. Yeah. Yeah, you think so? We've got yeah. eighteen hundred years of failure in that department. Failure. People come to Christ because they love Christ, not because they're told they must. Yes. And there, there's a separation there that Jesus makes to Caesar that which is Caesar's and to God that which is God's. It's intentional, and, and we need to keep that separation there. Gentlemen, we're all out of time. Yeah, <laughs> that's because Alex did so much talking. That time. <laughs> it was fascinating. I learned, I learned some new stuff today. Hey, Pastor Alex, would you uh, have a prayer with us? Yeah, we, absolutely. We close our program. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you again, Lord, that you have, have uh, so much insight and foreknowledge and wisdom that, uh, that you put the things together in such a way that, that, that they're clear, Lord. Yes. And, 
and we see that uh, the church had gone a, a certain way after after you established it through Jesus Christ and in, in the New Testament, it, it kind of veered off and you pulled it out and, and then you gave us this, this freedom that we have today that we enjoy. Uh, Father, we just pray that you help us to protect that as, uh, as we continue marching on in, in, in human history, Lord, that, that we will see the value of the sacrifices that have been made to give us the ability to, to have uh, differences of opinion and, and, and to, be, to be able to, as Sean said, to, to, to be able to coexist. And, uh, let us value that and let us hold that dear. Uh, be with us, Father, through, uh, throughout the rest of, of, of this journey. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, we've come to the end of another Lessons for Living television program. I can't thank my guests enough. That was a history lesson, Sean. Thank you so much for... Yeah, wouldn't you know it? I hated history in high school. <laughs> Until I became a Christian. That's what changed it all. That's wonderful. Yeah. Alex, want to remind us of uh, what's coming up April the 14th in Calgary. Yeah, uh, starting April 14th at the Windsport uh, Arena, the, the, uh, the hockey arena there, the Olympic Center. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna start start a Bible prophecy seminar. It's uh, it's kind of a TED Talk type of thing. It's a it's a relaxed feel. Just just come come as you are, and we're gonna look at uh, at at some of the the biggest and greatest Bible prophecies uh, uh, in Scripture. The stories that uh, that we have heard about. Uh, the stories that that um, that maybe we have misunderstood over the over the years. Yes. All of these things we're gonna talk about and put it together in in such a way that it will be easy to understand. And, and I think at the end, we're gonna, we're gonna see that, uh, that, again, Revelation Daniel is a love letter from, from God, letting us know that he loves us, he cares for us, and there is a future beyond what we're experiencing uh, today, and that that future, that, that eternity is beautiful, and we wanna be a part of that. We sure do. I, you don't wanna miss these seminars, folks. Go to revelationspeakspeace.com. You can visit our website, l4ltv.com and there will be a link so that you too can register and reserve your spot at the Revelation Speaks Peace Bible Seminar. We're all out of time. We'll see you here again next time. God bless you. We'll see you then.